Wonderful. The, the pumpkins are gone and the poinsettias are here. The oranges and the browns have been put away and the greens and the reds have been put up. It is a new season. And in some ways it feels like a whole lot longer than just like three days ago that we gathered around tables. And if your family or friends were anything like mine, you sat around a table full of turkeys and some of them were served for the meal. That's my family. And as it happens, this tends to be, and maybe it's, maybe it's you know, the kind of this way all the time, but I think that between Thanksgiving, Christmas, this whole Advent season, it tends to be a time where we tell and reminisce and retell our stories. It's not just a time for traveling and for shopping, it's a time for story swapping as we recount some of the same stories we've heard over and over and again in our families. We, we hear those stories that, uh, that are all about humor and some that are about horror. Some that are the days we would love to go back and just do all over again because they were so much fun. And others that we wish maybe had never happened to begin with. We hear those stories that have been told so many times that each time they're told they get embellished just a little bit more. And so now some years apart, it's hard to tell these stories that have become legend, at least in our family. It's hard to really tell the difference between embellishment and what actually happened back then. And what we do in our families, we do in the family. You notice when you came in today, not just because of the poinsettias, but because of the banners that mark our time for us, that uh, this started a new day, a new season, the first Sunday of Advent. The word Advent means coming. And over these next weeks, we are going to do what families do. We're going to tell the story, the story. And really, there's nothing new in it. It hasn't really changed a whole lot. But what my prayer is, is that we'll have a new way of telling it, maybe a new way of hearing it. And by the grace of God and the empowerment of his spirit, maybe some new ways of experiencing the old family stories that form us into the people that we are today. We're going to be doing that all this month primarily through um, the lenses of Matthew's gospel. Matthew opens up the, the story of the gospel, and he uses the literary form of genealogy. In other words, a bunch of list, it's a list of names. And if you've been one that's gone through like the Bible reading plan in a year, these are the chapters that you tend to like speed read, even if you're not a speed reader. Because um, to us, you know, we, we are newcomers, relative newcomers into the family. Now for them, they see a name and behind every name there's a story. For us, we need a little bit of help kind of catching up with all that. Which reminds me of a conversation I had with my sister-in-law um, earlier this week. We were in Ohio and she was kind of splitting time between her mom and, and uh, her in-laws. And she said, you know, we've been married for a few years now. They got a beautiful little baby. It's her first Christmas, Lily, six month old. Great little kid. Great to be able to hold her and give her back whenever she starts crying. Um, but she said, you know, a few years into it, now I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm learning how, to, how, it, how it rolls at the Schwab family. That's her in-laws. Because every family has their own stories, their own practices, their own ways of doing things. And, and you don't get all that the first time you come to the family table. Sometimes it takes a little time for that to kind of sink in. And so she was saying, you know, one of the things that I've learned at their house is they, you, you have to make a fuss about everything. Like, you don't just say, that was a great Thanksgiving meal. You got to, like, go into detail about the turkey and the cranberry salad and the mashed potatoes and how wonderful. And, and when somebody comes in, like all the rest of the family's there and somebody else arrives, everybody's got to get up and we got to go make a fuss over them. Now, um, if you don't do that, you're, you're not doing it the, the way the family does it. And so she said, it took me a little while to learn that, but I'm getting it all figured out of how this family operates. The same thing, I think, is really true about the family called the church. We don't just step into this group of people and all of a sudden know all the stories and how everybody functions and the things that are normal, like Advent and poinsettias. And, and it takes a little while sometimes to, to be exposed to the practices and the stories that form the family of God into who we really are. And uh, I'm still learning that story. The parts that I have learned, I'm telling, but I'm learning new parts all the time, and, and it's a wonderful thing. So for the next few weeks, we are going to be stepping into the story of the gospel as seen through the lenses of the gospel of Matthew. 
So he starts with this genealogy. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open them with me. We're going to do just the first couple of verses out of Matthew chapter 1 so you can remain seated. Um, and then we're going to be jumping to another scripture in a few minutes. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah, and his brothers. Now, to us, that may not mean a whole lot. But the way Matthew begins to tell his story, it gives us a clue into who he's writing to. He's writing to um, Jewish folks. Folks who could, could also trace their family lineage back to Abraham. Now, Matthew takes us back, like, not to Adam, but to Abraham, who was the father of the faith, the patriarch. It was, it was Abraham who became the father of the Jewish nation as a people. And so Matthew, in trying to tell the story to folks that are in that, that kind of, that's the lane they're in, he's immediately, right from the very first verse of this gospel, beginning to establish some relationship, some commonality, so that they can see this story of Jesus. It's not just a story about somebody else. This is, this is my story. This is our story. And even though we're not Jewish, the same is true for us. This is our story. And while Abraham, the founder of the faith, the patriarch, um, while his name appears in Matthew 1.1, his story is back in Genesis. So what we're going to do is kind of, we're going to look at this, this, uh, this genealogy to today only at Abraham, but we've got to go back to Genesis to kind of see what's going on, the, the story behind the name in, uh, in Matthew chapter 1. So, Go ahead and turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Genesis chapter 12. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. And once you've found your place, if you would stand, that would be awesome. And if you're new to us, this is one of these family things that we do. Not every family does this, but we do it. We typically stand when we read the word. And afterwards, I, I always say, this is the word of the Lord. And the people respond with... Thanks be to God. So if you're new, that's one of the things we do in our family. You can feel like you're part of it as you do that with us. The Lord had said to Abram, by the way, it's Abram in chapter 12 of Genesis. A little bit later, God's going to change his name to Abraham, but it's the same guy. So if you hear me say Abram and Abraham, they're just interchangeable. I haven't forgotten who I'm talking about. It's the same guy, okay? The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went, as the Lord told him, and Lot, that's his nephew, went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out for Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So the story of Abraham starts with God doing what God always does. God takes the initiative to begin a conversation with Abram. And that's one of the things that we believe to be true about God and all of us. Now, you would say, well, Pastor Steve, God didn't wake me up this morning and say, I want you to go to church. I took the initiative to come here. And maybe you did, you all did. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you're here and not somewhere else. I'm glad you're here. But you're only partially right. You, you took the initiative to be here, but it was only in response to a God who already, long ago, took the first step toward all of us. And any conversation that I've ever had with God, it happens because long before I ever went looking for God, he went looking for me. And the same is true for you as well. And you might be at a point where in your life where you're like, well, I haven't really heard God doing that for me. And I, sometimes it's, um, it's, only, it's only after we've made it a little while and looking back that things start to become a little more clear, right? But you just keep walking with Jesus and you'll be able to look back and see that it wasn't you, but it was him who made the first move, took the first step, initiated the first conversation. And when he does that with Abram, the first word God says to him is, Go! No, hey, Abram, how you doing? What's up? How's the family? What's going on? None of that. The first thing that God says to him is, go. And we find in this story 
of the gospel, the story of God's saving work that starts in Genesis and goes all the way through Revelation, is that it's a pretty common thing for God to begin a conversation with those same words. Go. He didn't just do that for Abram. You know, that's what he said to Moses. Go where? Go to Pharaoh. And tell him, let my people go. Set them free. I want you to go to Pharaoh. He said to Nehemiah, when Jerusalem was in ruins and the walls had fallen down, God said to him, I want you to go. Go to the city and repair the walls. Go do something in my... I'm t- don't sit back where you are right here. Go. He said, he said to Samuel, the prophet, I want you to go. And it was real specific. I want you to go to Bethlehem. You're going to find a guy there named Jesse. He's got a bunch of sons. And one of them is going to be anointed as the next king over Israel. I want you to go. And whether it's, it's Jeremiah or Ezekiel or, or Haggai or Hosea or Malachi or whoever. And all those prophets, that, you know, those name books in the Old Testament. One thing that they have in common is that God said to all of them, I'm going to give you a message and what I want you to do is go. And share that with my people. God's like, oh, he, he's all the time telling people, I want you to go. We, we, the same thing happens in the New Testament. You read about Paul's story in the book of Acts. One night he has a vision, and it's a guy from Macedonia. He has not heard yet anything at all about the gospel. And so God speaks to him and says, I want you to go. Go tell him. And then Matthew 28 as Jesus is ascending, he says to his disciples, which means, here's what, they, it means he says it to all of us too. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, so you go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And here's his promise. As you go, I'm going to be right there with you. I think that this word go that comes to Abram is really a great, it's, a, it's really indicative of what a life of following God is all about. It's, it's, it's with God, he's always on the go. <laughs> he's always pushing, prodding, inviting, wooing. He's, he's saying to people just like us, this Christian life of following Jesus, it's not stagnant and sedentary and predictable and mundane. It's not you get stuck in a rut and you just stay there. God is always calling people to go. I can remember whenever I was a kid, people would be, and maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's that way now. But somebody would come and maybe it was a missionary or the, the pastor would be talking about God calling you and this call story of Abraham to go is a pretty popular one in that. And one of the big fears was always, I don't know if I want to say yes to God or not because if I go, I mean, if I say yes to his go, it, it might take me to, anybody guess where? Africa. I don't know what was the big deal. That was always a big thing. Like, oh no, don't send me to Africa. But what I've found to be true most of the time is that, you know, God does send people to Africa. But more often than not, he doesn't send people around the world or across the globe. He sends them across the street. And his go comes in the form of Go to that coworker just down the hall whose life you know is a train wreck and falling apart and they got nobody they're talking to except for people that are giving them bad advice. I want you to go to them. Don't wait for them to come to you. Sometimes God's go comes in the form of go, go across the street or go next door to that neighbor that you wave at, you say hello to, but you've been living next to them for 5, 10, 15 years and you've never had a conversation with them about Jesus. It's time to stop sitting back and letting them come to you and time for you to go to them. God's always telling people to go. Sometimes he tells us to go make it right with somebody that we're sideways with. Yeah, this relationship will get better whenever they get, they get it figured out that it's all their fault and they come to me and apologize. Then it'll all be fine. Of course, none of y'all ever do that, but it happens sometimes. And the Bible that I read Always, 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 it always pushes the believer to be the one who takes the first step and to go make things right. Sometimes God's go is go to a Sunday school class or go to a small group. Go deeper in your relationships with other people and let them see the real you. Be done with all this surface Christianity business and get serious about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Sometimes God's go is go to your prayer closet. And don't come out of there until you know you've heard from me. Go to the Word. 
Go deeper in your walk with me. I think that God is all the time telling people to go. And maybe he's telling some of us this morning, I want you to go too. And it's not like Abram, you got to go, you know, work to this unknown place. He's going to make real specific what he wants you to do, where he wants you to go and what he wants you to be about. And my prayer today is that he's doing that all over the place. And as he does, we're listening and we're like, okay, yeah, I'll do that. Count me in. Some of us have been doing that. It's fun to go. You know, I like to go. I like to go new places. Oftentimes, I, I don't even drive the same way back and forth somewhere because I want to go somewhere new. I like to go. I like to go out to eat. Hint, 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 Kristen. I like to go out on a date with Michelle. I, I like to go new places. I like to go on vacation. I, I like to go. But something that I've discovered, and you guys, I mean, you already know this, but it just really hit me this week, like, wow, that's a lot of truth in that, is that going would be great all the time and if it didn't at the same time mean leaving. See, that's the thing about going. Going always means leaving. Like last week, I, I went to Ohio to see family. And it was great to go, but it meant leaving here. And I don't like leaving here. I don't like missing out on what happens here on Sunday. And thanks to Joe for doing a great job last week. And I will not forget the wig picture. <laughs> uh-huh. I'm going to tuck that one away. And just when you least expect it, man, it's going to come back out. Um, I, I, liked, I really liked going back home yesterday. And the drive back to Tennessee was like every mile that I drew closer to here, it was felt more real and more good. And yet it meant leaving people that I don't get to see very often. Going always means leaving. And that's the way our, our relationship with Christ starts. It's, it's this word repentance, it means to turn around. And when we turn away from our sin and we turn towards Jesus, that when we go towards him, it always mean, means we're leaving something else. We, we go towards a holy life and we leave a sinful life. We go towards a selfless life and we leave a self-centered way of living. We go towards grace and we leave ugliness of judgmental, all that stuff that goes with it. When God calls us to go, it's exciting, it's wonderful, it's amazing, but it always involves leaving something. And I think that's where a lot of people in the Christian walk kind of get in trouble. Because we want to go with God without leaving our sin. And if you've ever tried to do that, it's a recipe for misery. It just doesn't work. He calls us to go. And maybe this morning, for some of us, this very day, today's the day... That it's the first day ever that you say yes to the invitation to go with God and to go away from sin. And that needs to happen this very day. That'd be awesome. I would love that. Couldn't think of a better day for it to happen than now. Better, better, better place for it to happen than here. When Abram heard God's go, I, I promise you, he understood a lot about what that meant he had to leave. And the list is given there in, uh, in Genesis chapter 12. It meant that he had to leave his family. It meant that he had to leave security and an inheritance and a blessing. It meant that he had to leave what was familiar and comfortable. And here, here like if I was a missionary, this would be about when Africa would come in, right? <laughs> he had to leave all of those things that were security, that were comfort, that were real for him in order to say yes to God's great big go. And every time we hear a word from God and he says go, we're going to have to leave something. What are you willing to leave in order to go where God wants you to go? In order to do what God wants you to do? In order to be what God would have you to be? Going... We get, you know, we get that. We, we know that it's part of what it means to be a follower. In the last few months, we've been able to do that in some pretty, I think, creative ways um, corporately. And a lot of that's thanks to Christy Thomas. Her, I love how her mind works. So a couple months ago, we, we went to Honeysuckle Hill Farms, right? And we said, our attitude is, let's go. Give me one of those crazy t-shirts with Undead by Graces. We're going to point people to a phenomenal website with these amazing stories of life transformation from some of the people right here. Let's go. And last weekend, a couple days ago, two days ago, Friday, 
How many of y'all were part of the flash mob? Sweet. You guys rock. I miss being there for that, but it's awesome to be able to be in Ohio and bring up Fox 17 and get a story about Grace Church Nazarene taking Jesus to the mall. Or actually just acknowledging that he was already there. And what happened last Friday was, a lot of y'all didn't say, well, we've got the good news right here. If people want it, they can come and get it. If people are broken and they want to get fixed up, let them come here. I mean, it's right out there on the sign. Grace is on there. If they're tired of a world where they get beat up all the time, they want some grace in their life, let them come here. 3135 Trenton Road. We said that's not our attitude. It's not a word to the world that says come. It's a word to the church that says go and we go. And that's what we're about here. That's what we want to be about more and more and more and more. That's what we're doing next weekend at Christmas on the Cumberland. It's, we're going. And you have a chance to get in on that. God said go to Abram. And he, he knew that it was going to cost him dearly. And that, I guess, is where faith comes in. Abram was, I mean, he's known as the father of the faith. He's in the Hebrews uh, Hall of Fame, chapter 11, as being a man who, who, even though he did not know, was ahead. He knew the God who was calling him ahead. And he was willing to say yes to that. I think God has a right to ask people to say go. I believe that God has a right to say to anybody that he wants to, Go! I'm going to say it again because a couple people said, yes, that's right, with an amen. But I'm telling you, God has a right to say to anybody he wants to, go. Amen. Why does he have that right? Because that's the story of the gospel. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he understands that going means leaving. In 1738, Charles Wesley wrote a great hymn. And the title of it is, And Can It Be? One of those verses says, he is talking about Jesus. He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace. Emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free, and oh my God, it found out me. He left his father's throne. If there's anybody that understands what leaving means, it's Jesus. Because in order to, to go for us and to us, he had to leave a lot. And I think that earns him the right to say to any of us about anything, go. Back to Abram. So we got this genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 that begins with the genealogy of Jesus, the son of God, son of man, the son of Abraham. This is really cool. Abraham's willingness to say yes when God said go got him a permanent place in the genealogy of Jesus. He became the first of a whole line of people that comes right down to you and to me who heard God say go and they said I will. Go out of your life of sin and go towards God. I will. Go out of what you're comfortable with into something that's not very comfortable. I'll go. And all the way through the family story that we read about these names, that every name has a story behind it, it's just a bunch of people who just like the father Abraham, when God said go, they said, all right, I will. And when he did, it affected him, and it affected his kids, and his grandkids, and their kids after that, and their kids after that. When God says go and we go, it always has that kind of an impact. It always affects not just us, but the people who come after us. And as I'm getting older, this is really scary for me, but I, and you know, like year-wise, I'm closer to being a grandparent than I, than I am to what I was whenever I started being a parent. Scary! But it's also scary because I'm reminded that everything that I say and everything that I do, where I go and where I refuse to go, has a trickle-down effect not just on my kids, but on the kids that come after them. And if Christ should tarry, the kids who come after them. This obedience to God business, it's really big. Because it affects more than just us. Abram's in this phenomenal story. 
in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, telling the story of Jesus. Because when God said go, he said, all right, count, sign me up. And I'm wondering this morning if there aren't some people here who, as you live the story of your life in Christ, he's calling for a new chapter. And he's pushing you into places you wouldn't have not seen yourself going. Into doing things you would not have seen yourself do. But he's saying it and you know his voice and he's saying, I'm telling you, go. And it might be go from, from a life of sin into a life of holiness. It might be go across the street. It might be go down the hall. It might be go to Africa for all I know. You're part of a great family. And you have a great heritage of people who said yes to God when God said go. Maybe today you need to say yes because God's saying go to you. We come to our table. That's what families do when they get together. They eat, right? And in the church, we come to this table. It's not our table. It's God's table. And this is a place where um, the Christ who bids us to go reminds us that everywhere we go, he's promised to go with us. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he got, he got with his disciples and he broke bread with them. They were eating a meal called the Passover and what he did was he broke some bread and he redefined what that bread was all about. And he said, from now on, this isn't the, you know, the unleavened bread of the Passover that represents whenever we got out of, uh, out of bondage in Egypt. This, this represents my blood, my body, which is broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this... This represents my blood, which is going to be shed for you. Whenever you all get together, don't forget that. Remember that you would not have a life unless I gave it to you. And your relationship with God could have never been restored had I not made the first step towards you. Everything else in your life, it's our response to that. And so today, we're not forced or coerced. We're invited to respond to his invitation to come to this place of grace where we can find forgiveness if we need that and we can find the grace to say yes to whatever God's go is where, where we can be reminded and thankful all over again that God will never, ever, ever tell us to go without going with us. Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, thank you. Thank you for not, I mean... What we get in your word is pretty incredible because it's, it's your story, but it's more than your story. It's like the story behind the story. And I thank you today for our ancestors, for people of faith in decades and ages past who modeled for us how to say yes to God in spite of what all that meant. And I really don't know what all that means for us today. But I pray for that one who you really are saying, it's time for you to be walking away from a sinful way of life and walking towards me. Just leave it and go. It may be that you're saying go across the street. Go deeper into your relationships with other people. Go to that place of prayer. Go Make it a priority to be, I don't know, God, what all you're saying to people today, but would you give us grace in these moments to be obedient to you? To say yes to you just like Abram did? I thank you, Jesus, for your broken body and shed blood. That you said, you said okay, I'm going, whenever our life was a mess and we had no way of making it right. We appreciate that. We thank you for your grace that meets us even where we are today. And I pray that even now you will bless and consecrate these sacred symbols of your broken body and shed blood that they would become for us a sustaining, nourishing taste of grace. I pray it in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite our servers, if they would, to join me up here. And if this is your first time being with us on a communion Sunday, um, you don't have to be a member here. You don't have to have ever been here before because this, this doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. And he's the one that extends the invitation for us to come and meet him here at his table. So you're invited to participate.